The crew of the East India Company ship, the Sussex, under the command of their captain, got ready to abandon ship. Another East India Company ship, the Winchester, was standing by to take them off. Not all of the crew was united, however. There was a small, stubborn group who felt that the ship just needed a little repair to be right again. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the twice-abandoned Sussex? Here we are. Enjoy! The Sussex was on a homeward-bound journey from Canton, modern Guangzhou, carrying a cargo of chinaware, when a heavy storm near the Cape of Good Hope hit her on the evening of the 9th of March, 1738. The ship had been sailing under full sail, and the crew rushed to respond to the change in weather by cluing up the topsails and then trying to do the same with the fore topsail. They were in the middle of this work when the fore topsail split. With the split of the foresail, the ship pitched to one side, submerging her starboard gunnel in the raging sea. The ship had already had a list since the day before, when the crew had been told to shift some cargo. But in such a storm, the list went from an annoyance to potentially deadly. The carpenter sounded the pumps and found that there was three feet of water in the hold, and the men were put to work on the pumps. Two hours later, it became clear that the water was winning the race. Rather than the water in the ships getting lower, it had risen to ten feet. The crew of the ship, realizing that things were going to get even worse if they did not find a solution, cut away her mizzenmast in the hopes that it would help her right herself more quickly in the strong seas. But she was still sluggish, and the water was still rising. The mainmast was clearly the problem, and this was cut away as well, at which point the ship rode the sea with more ease. With the masts gone, the men were able to pump out most of the water, and by five in the morning, there was only two and a half feet of water in the well, since her gunnels were no longer being dipped beneath the water. Since the ship was now more consistently upright, they were able to reduce the amount of work on the pumps that was needed, and they were able to keep the water entering the ship at bay with just a single hand pump that they were even able to pause work on occasionally to rest. The next morning, they were placed to split foresail, and the Sussex was able to keep company with the Winchester overnight that night. Even though the Sussex was still down both the main and mizzen masts, and they still had to make use of the hand pump. On the morning of the 11th, having had a day to look over the condition of his ship, Captain Francis Gosselin held a meeting with his officers, and, having discussed their options, went out on deck and called all hands. Once he had gathered the crew, Captain Gosselin announced that he and the officers had talked it over and decided that their best option was to abandon ship and move what they could over to the Winchester. They were concerned that if they had hit a bad storm while rounding the Cape, the Sussex would be lost with all hands in a place where the Winchester would be unable to give them assistance. Captain Gostelin most likely thought that this order would be carried out without question but he was met by about 30 men of the crew who did not agree with his decision at all. These men, all common sailors, were led by a man called John Dean, and he spoke for the group when he said it seemed like a shame to abandon a ship in relatively good condition when they could bring her home after some repairs. Captain Gosselin was unmoved by the argument and began to prepare to abandon ship even though the group led by John Dean remained adamant that they would remain on board. As more and more items were moved on board the Winchester, though, and it became more and more clear that they were about to be abandoned, some of the men who had followed John Dean switched sides and went with the others over to the Winchester. Two of the men who remained on the ship beside John Dean 
had personal reasons to stand by him. John Dean, James Holland, and William Spence had all come from Scarborough together, and they had joined the crew of the Sussex together. Now that the crew was fracturing, the three men continued to be a united front. This was to be a benefit of all of the men who had chosen to remain on the ship, since James Holland had experience with navigation, something the rest of them lacked. If John Dean thought that parting between the two ships was going to be a peaceful one, he was mistaken. Captain Gosselin was not pleased by their stubborn determination to try to save the Sussex. And while he predicted their failure, he also seems to have done everything in his power to ensure it. The men from the Winchester's boats joined the men of the Sussex, who were leaving her and taking whatever they wanted from her. Captain Gosselin ordered that the only ship's boat the Sussex still had, that was in good condition, was to be stove in before they left. The first mate refused to give John Dean the longitude so that they could navigate the Sussex. The ship's carpenter was wandering the ship and paying special attention to the gun room, where he made comments and made the people who had decided to remain suspicious that he intended to drive out the stern port. They were forced to follow him around to ensure that he would not do to the ship more harm than she was already suffering. The final straw for the men who were still on board of the Sussex was when Captain Gostlin ordered men back to cut down the foresail, the ship's one remaining sail, before they left. John Dean and his companions were no longer willing to stand by and do nothing and several of them went up with shrouds, with sponge staffs from the ship's cannons, and threatened to knock the saboteurs down if they did not leave the ship. The sail was left intact. The men who remained on the Sussex did convince the first mate to give them a letter saying that the ship had been willingly abandoned, and that the men who were still on her were the ones who had chosen to stay behind since the men on the Sussex were worried that they would be accused of piracy if they sailed into a port with a ship that did not have any officers. With this letter given, the Winchester departed, leaving in total 16 men still standing on the deck of the Sussex. Captain Gosselin, as one last act of what the men remaining on the Sussex assumed was spite, took most of the navigational equipment off of the ship. James Holland and Andrew White took command of the Sussex once the Winchester had left, and the men set to work trying to get the Sussex back into working order. The ship still had a list, so they took two of the cannons from the starboard side of the ship and threw them overboard, which helped correct the remaining problem. They also added an additional sail to the foremast. They knew that they would need to reach a harbor to be able to work on the ship properly, and so, under the guidance of James Holland, they headed to Madagascar. Seven days after taking command of the ship, they were able to anchor in St. Augustine Bay. The next few weeks were spent repairing the ship and returning to the normal routines of shipboard life. They rigged a temporary mainmast fixed the ship's boat that had been stove in by the order of Captain Gosselin, and shifted the cargo in the ship's hold to mend the reason that the ship had been unbalanced in the first place. While searching the ship for further leaks, the men found a pound of loose gunpowder in one of the quarter galleries, and they became suspicious once again that their former captain and shipmates had intended for them to never survive their voyage. In order to prevent the local population from becoming suspicious of a ship just anchoring in their bay without anyone coming on shore, one of the men pretended to be their captain and went ashore to make their greetings. The men on the Sussex were concerned that they would be seen as easy victims if their actual numbers were known, and so when asked how big his crew was, the representative of the Sussex claimed to have 30 men on board. This story probably would have been more successful if they had remained in the bay at a shorter amount of time. As it was, when people on the shore came on board, they asked where the remaining men were, seeing how few men were on deck. 
The men on the Sussex told them that the remainder of the men were sick below, but the suspicions of those on shore were awakened. The relationship between ship and shore, which had started out cordial, quickly deteriorated. The reality of how small the crew of the Sussex was began to become clear, and with this, the people on shore became more aggressive, and those on board the Sussex began to fear that the locals were going to try to take their ship from them. Three weeks after arriving in St. Augustine Bay, the Sussex departed, those on board of her feeling that they had overstayed their welcome. They set their course for Mozambique. Their day of departure had been partially decided by the good weather, but as the second day wore on, the weather became cloudier and the waves became more choppy. With the darker skies by ten at night, they had no chance of seeing the rocky reef that the Sussex fell victim to. With the first strike on the reef, the ship lost her rudder. With the second, she struck hard on the rock, and it was clear to those on board that their mission to save the Sussex was at an end. There would be no chance of saving her now. They had fixed the ship's boat before, and they thought of abandoning ship on her. But since they did not know where they were, and they did not entirely trust her since she had only been patched, and the seas were rough, they decided to only swing the boat out in case they needed to abandon the ship in a hurry. And then they waited for daylight. By the light of day, they were able to pull out the ship's charts. And after some investigation, they realized that they were on Basas da India. Though when they took their noon reading, they found that their chart and the rocky atoll's location differed. And that was the reason their course had failed. The knowledge of where they were was not a great comfort. Basas da India is a circular rocky atoll that is mostly entirely submerged during high tide and therefore does not have any vegetation. The group prepared the ship's boat for a voyage by putting supplies in her as well as a compass, but when it came time to launch her, only nine of the men got on board of her, including John Dean. The rest of the men decided to remain on the ship even though it was now breaking apart. The sea was still so choppy that the remaining men still felt as though they had a better chance of survival if they remained on the Sussex. Their doubts were proven to be fair when the boat was struck by a large wave right after they had launched it, and all of the men on board of her were washed out. Only five of the men made it to shallow water from this disaster. The already once mended boat was not up for the task of withstanding the waves, and it broke in half. The men spotted the front half of the boat floating in the distance, and they retrieved it, and with it a flask half full of adak. Once they had the base for a boat, they lashed some planking from the wreck onto her to make her more buoyant, and lashed her in shallow water so they could decide what to do next. From their perspective, they could see the Sussex break up entirely against the reef. Two of the five remaining men from the boat were ill and had fevers, but the remaining men got to work rebuilding the boat with pieces of the ship they could find using two small knives and a ring bolt as their only tools. They managed to make an acceptable boat by the third day since leaving the Sussex, and they had even found a piece of pork and a butt of water. Among the men who survived was James Holland, the man who had acted as navigator up until this point. Thanks to his guidance, they were able to reach Madagascar once again, though the voyage took them 17 days, with only the pork and water split between the five men. Once they reached Madagascar, they began to wander, always looking for people to help them and take pity on them. For the most part, they were met with kindness but they knew they were going to need the support of the king in order to get on board of a European ship, and they therefore headed towards Mojavo. Unfortunately, once they arrived, they were told he had gone on a trip, but one of his close advisors took the men into his care. For five months, the sailors remained in the advisor's care. After two months, James Holland passed. He had been sick for some time and finally succumbed but the next man who passed made the others more suspicious 
because it was sudden and they thought he had been poisoned. By the time that they were finally called to go meet the king, John Dean was the only one who was well enough to survive the trip back to Mahabo. John Dean was well liked by the king, who treated him as a companion, and he repeatedly suggested that the next time a French ship came, he would be allowed to leave with them, but the king did not seem inclined to agree. Finally, a French crew did come to Mohabo, and once John Dean told them of his situation, one of the French officers hinted to the king that his captain would not be happy to hear of a detained Englishman, and John Dean was allowed to go with them. John Dean dispersed his last few belongings as gifts to the friends who had been kind to him during his stay in Madagascar, and went with the French crew to the harbor, where he was overjoyed to find that there was also a British vessel in the port. John Dean, after telling his story to the captain of the British East India Company vessel, the Prince William, found himself welcomed on board. News of John Dean's survival outpaced his arrival in English waters again, since the ship that he had boarded was headed to Bombay. He wrote his personal narrative in the form of a pamphlet, one of which found its way into the hands of the directors of the East India Company, who were understandably unhappy. They had already interviewed the captains of both the Winchester and the Sussex over the abandonment of a ship that could have been saved, and having found the reasons they gave lacking, they had already decided that neither man was to ever be employed by the company again. That the company took the matter seriously can be demonstrated by the fact that they almost immediately sent a ship to Madagascar to try to get an account from the king there of what he knew about the entire matter. Armed with the story told by John Dean, the East India Company went to the courts and Captain Gosling was ordered to pay for the entire lost cargo of the Sussex, amounting to £25,000. They judged him to be a direct contributor for the death of the men who had remained on the Sussex. Captain Gosling fled to Batavia, being afraid to ever return to England in case there would be continued ramifications should he be in the reach of the East India Company again. The company did their best to make up to John Dean what he had endured after Captain Gosling left Sussex. He was protected by the company from having to worry about press gangs, even though he was returning to England in a time of war as a sailor. Instead, they put him in a high position in a warehouse and gave him a pension of £100, with a promise of £50 a year to his wife if she should survive him. They also hired a painter to make three pictures of John Dean, one to be given to him and the other two to hang in their offices to inspire their staff to look after company property as well as John Dean had endeavored to do. John Dean passed away in 1747. The remains of the Sussex have been found. But as John Dean reported, the ship had broken apart. There was little left of her to be of great archaeological significance, though some of the bottle fragments have been studied. The narrative of John Dean and his portrait is most of what is left of the Sussex. In his narrative, John Dean listed the names of the men who had remained on the Sussex with him, ensuring that they too would be remembered through his fame. For more information, please see Dangers of the Deep by Thomas Nelson published in 1848, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.